Tom, we're here for you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we, we are a small group, so uh, I'm going to get through some of the information, but I think it'd be uh, a good idea to, to maybe get the group involved. And uh, I'm sure everybody's got some good ideas for the town of and I'm sure we'll be able to feed each other. So let me, uh, let me start off with some of the presentation material I have, and then we'll go from there. Thanks. All right, what exactly is Gorilla Tennis Marketing? Ideas and ways to market your product or service relying on your time, energy, and imagination rather than a bottom list of marketing budget or the hiring of a large advertising or public relations firm. So there are groups out there that all they do is PR, market, but they have a lot of money. It takes a lot of money. Sometimes in our business, we just don't have the discretionary income or the, the, the money put aside in our businesses to take advantage of that. So we have to be creative, and that's what this is all about. To be a gorilla tennis marketer, you have to survive. So you've got to have an open mind to alternative methods of, of marketing. Uh, you've got to define what you're attacking. If you can't define it, you cannot attack it. You've got to decide what media is best to serve your needs. So let's talk first about the state of the economy. And this is the overall economy right now. These are, these are numbers from the 2019 fourth quarter. 2.3% growth for GDP, pretty good. Uh, per capita, 59,500 per capita as a, uh, an income, which is pretty good. 3.6 on employment, pretty good, and inflation at 2.1 rate. So our overall economy for the U.S. right now is deemed relatively good. But the next one is the biggest thing that affects us. Discretionary spending is predicted to increase by 5% in 2020. And that's our business. That's where our market is. We need people to spend extra money on us uh, because we're in the entertainment business. We're in the fun business. And when things get rough, we're the first group that gets cut out. So that's a good number for us to, to see. As far as the state of the tennis industry, excuse me, overall participation is up 1%, 17.9 million players. When you look at that 17.9 million, that's not a real big number, but uh, the fact that our participation is growing some, rather than going the opposite direction. Core tennis players, however, is down 1%. Um, and it's important to note that the core tennis players they account for 10 of our total. Those core players are the ones that are really buying expenditures. The tennis players, those core players are the ones that are really buying. So that's the number that's more relative to us. And cardio tennis is booming. It's up 12.6%. So. Um, if that's not something you're taking advantage of at your club, that's something that's hot right now and you need to jump on it. Here are some numbers on the tennis industry. These, are, these numbers are from 2018. I, I couldn't find the 19 numbers. But um, youth tennis participation, these are real numbers, 4.6 million players. And it's broken up into ages 6 to 12, ages um, 13 to 17. Uh, so you can see that this is a pretty big market of the overall numbers of players. As far as manufacturers, wholesale shipments, these are in units, rackets 2.2 million, strings 2.7 million, tennis balls 106 million, where uh, four and a half are, are pretty much the rogie balls. Um, and a lot of times tennis balls is used as the basic barometer of uh, of how the industry is going. But these numbers aren't great numbers, uh, but still the numbers we need to, to be aware of and how we structure our business. As far as your, your constituency, 55% of the players are male, 45% are female. That makes you think about how your program is designed. As far as ethnicity, African Americans, almost 9%, Asian Pacific Islanders, Nine and a half percent, Caucasians, almost seventy percent, Hispanics, almost eleven percent. Ages of the players and how they break down. 
Again, you see the, uh, the youth as a, as a quarter of our participation. And uh, that number that is pretty striking is 40% of the tennis players are over 845 uh, and above. So that's, a, that's an interesting number that needs to be calculated when you do your programming. Education, boy, we are an educated group. No question about that. Almost 50% of our players have a college degree or higher. That's, that's pretty impressive. Income, again, this is where there's opportunity to, to uh, partner with other businesses because everybody likes the numbers here for, for tennis. Over 40% with incomes, household incomes for 100,000 plus, that's a pretty big number. You can see the breakdown. 59% uh, of tennis players have a household income greater than $75,000 a year. So, it's a jungle out there. We've got to make sure that when we put our, our marketing <coughs> hats on, we have to uh, make sure everything is oriented to the customer. That's the person who is either going to make us succeed or the person who is going to help us fail. 70% of new businesses are out of business in five years. So when you do all your guerrilla tennis marketing, you need to make sure you have a, a significant battle plan. And when you do that battle plan, it's important to set it up in timed um, dependencies so that you can constantly break down and follow those, those uh, timed attacks. Um, once you decide what, those, what that plan is, you don't want to do too much changing. You want to make sure that you're pushing your plan ahead and it takes time. I'll just touch on some marketing myths that are in the, uh, they're, they're all marketers. Number one, radio and television advertising is too costly and that's not quite true. Now, if you want to advertise during the Super Bowl, yes, I would say that it's quite costly. But there are uh, all kinds of um, uh, radio ads that when you buy multiple ads at a time, I mean, it can be as, as low as $50 a month and getting your name and business out there. And, and you need to research the local market. Word of mouth marketing is all great business needs, and that is not true. Uh, it limits your growth. Uh, you, you do need to have a marketing plan. You do need to spend some money to market your, your wares and your businesses. The purpose of marketing is to generate maximum sales volume so it's not so much sales volume as the bottom line, the sales profit. I go back to like my first talk where my colleague bought out his competitors and his sales volume was, was enormous, but his profit, his bottom line was not as high. So, so the, the goal is to really increase your, your bottom line, your profit. All right, quality is the main determinant in influencing sales. And, uh, and that's, uh, that is not the, uh, the, the truth, that's a myth, because confidence and customer service are the uh, one and two uh, ways to uh, increase your sales. And remember, a lot of times now we're, we're marketing and against the internet businesses, and it's difficult, it is very difficult. But what we have is we have customer service and uh, your local businesses can uh, fight that battle by increasing that customer service. It's always important to have some kind of sale, um, but sales become addictive. And there are people out there that are just going to wait for a sale all the time. So pick and choose when you do your sales. Um, a lot of times they're attached to certain times of the year and uh, they're consistent. People may look for that. But if you're always having the same sale once a month, uh, people are just not going to buy at total retail. They're always going to look at that discounted price and that affects your bottom line. Once your business has a, a solid customer base, it can cease marketing. And again, that's not true. Marketing is a continuous effort. Uh, customers have to consistently be wine and dined. You know, it's interesting. I'll get off on a quick tangent. I just uh, received just earned my Mississippi uh, salesperson real estate license in Mississippi. And, uh, and I'm going through a series of education for sales, real estate sales. And one of the guys, one of the seminars, the guy said, well, you need to go ahead and find out who the best lenders are 
and start taking them out to lunch once, once a week or once a month. Um, because you need to get that, that network going and it'll keep your name in front of those people. And I think it's the same in tennis. Uh, you need to, to find out some of the influencers who can help you and, uh, and make sure you stay close to them. If a prospect says he or she wants to think it over before making a purchase, they will probably purchase later. But the problem is when they buy, they usually don't buy from you. So it's important for you to try to close sales in your market. So, I look at it as a war. It's a war between our businesses and the big boys, or the big girls' businesses. You're competing against clubs, facilities, businesses that may have more money than you, have deeper inventories, have larger professional staffs, have greater amenities than you have, and already have established reputations. So, how can you compete against that? So we'll get into some warfare. And these are strategy, strategies and tactics that I have used that seem to work and, uh, and I've also taken from other businesses that have worked. So first we'll talk about some ideas that uh, cost you nothing. So really, again, this is based on ingenuity and, uh, and, and sweat equity, basically. Number one, define your product or service niche. Positioning. Which segment of the market do you want to be in? Base it on either geographic location, age, estimated gross income. I mean, if your business is uh, in an area that is, uh, does not have a lot of uh, discretionary spending, then your product sales have to be based on uh, pricing that is going to be competitive to that area. Uh, you need to do some research to find out what is in your area to before you start setting up all your pricing. Makes a big difference. Theme or slogan, it gives you identity. And we talk, you've heard several of us now talk about identity and how important that is. Identity will summarize um, your company and its benefits. At one point in my life, I had a company called Online uh, Banner and Engraving. And we did banners and, and trophies and awards for the tennis industry. Uh, so, I think I forgot the, the title of the, uh, um, what the slogan was for that. It's been so many years. Um, oh, online engraving, we make you look good was my title. And, uh, and everything that I put out in the market, it had that same slogan. I think that was uh, something that identified the business. Your pricing niche, high, medium, or low. 14% of consumers say it's the number one factor. So, do you want to be a family dollar store? Do you want to be a, uh, a Walmart or a middle market area? Or do you want to be a Neiman Marcus where you're the highest price in town and uh, everybody knows it, but that's, that's how your reputation states. So that's something that you need to set up front and get that word out. Because you'll be identified as that. Doesn't mean good or bad. Some people, will go only to the place that, that charges the most. And some people will never go to that place and always look for, for discounts. Uh, so really, if, if, I'm not saying, I'm not uh, uh, re recommending either one of those. It's just know yourself, know your business, and make sure that it's, it's, uh, it's something you can market. Hours of operation. If you have some big boys out there with, with standalone shops, um, you can compete against them by changing your hours of operation. Set some hours that are different than your main competitors. If your main competitor is in a big retail store, in a big shopping center, they open at 10 o'clock, open at 9 o'clock so people can drop off a racket before they go to work or, or, uh, or, or stay open a little bit later so they can catch it on the way home. Uh, you can compete, but you have to know your competition. Phone demeanor. I can't tell you how many times a, a, a good person on the phone affects sales. And, and, and frankly, a person who is not enthusiastic on the phone, I mean, that could hurt your business more than you realize. Find someone who is a happy person and has a good phone demeanor and uh, 
makes you feel good. It changes the personality of the consumer. It really does. So you need to find that person, and uh, and that person should be in, in charge of uh, answering your phones. Customer recourse. Have a clear policy on how to handle unhappy customers. And, uh, and something that's very relatable to everybody is, is strength. I've had, uh, I've had st staff or myself strain a racket, and someone picks up the racket, they hit two balls, and the string breaks. They, they're all upset. I just paid X amount of dollars for my racket to be stringing. And you look at the string and say, oh, well, you know, you probably hit it right on the, <laughs> on the edge of the frame, and, uh, or right by a, a, a knot, and uh, it was really a miss hit that caused the break. Uh, wasn't a stringing error, but you, you, can't, you can't worry about that. What you have to do is just tell them, look, we'll string it for nothing, eat, eat the loss, and that person will come back. That person will come back and, and make sure that you get all the business. So you need to set that um, recourse, customer recourse policy, have it printed on the wall if you need to, but um, be known for that. And no one wants to work with the, with the group that says, oh, I'm sorry, this, uh, this, this shirt didn't fit, I can't, replay, I can't exchange it. And they won't come back to you. Community involvement. Tennis pros are more community involved than almost any other industry. I mean, we do it all. We, we do it for industry people. We do it for uh, charities. Uh, how many of you have done something for, for American Heart Association or one of the ch charities? I'm sure everybody in this room has done something for that. Problem is, we do it and we never tell anybody about it. So spend 10, mi 10 minutes putting something on your wall and uh, okay, I, I helped out with doing a, a charity event for four or five hours. I'll spend 10 minutes and, and put it up on the wall with, with their logo and uh, people know that I'm involved in the community. I don't know if you've ever, um, I'm Italian so I go to a lot of pizzerias. And if you ever, if you ever go to a pizza place, you walk in the door and there's all these trophies on the wall, usually like softball trophies, or and, and they've always given back to something to the local community. But um, they advertise it. And I think it's important for tennis people to do that as well. Tie-ins and co-ops. So, coupons are a big deal. And again, you're, you're, you're attacking a market where people are looking for discounts. Um, and it's easy for them to get that discount but bundle them with another product. I know sometimes uh, I have used uh, sign up for a, uh, a cruise on a cruise ship and they'll come out and they'll put a uh, uh, something on the counter which advertises their product. At the same time, I'll, I'll be able to add something on the brochure for a discounted stringing job or a discount for a lesson or something like that. So when you start partnering with people, then you both benefit. Testimonials. Everybody has done something where um, people have been happy with your efforts and find someone to write a quote or a, or a testimonial and frame it and put it on the wall. Um, people believe in testimonials. So I'm not, I'm not asking you to fabricate anything, but there are plenty of people that like what you're doing. Find a few, put it up on, on, on your your Facebook page or your website or anything, and uh, and post it, and, and again it gives you credibility. Music thing. Um, music is very very powerful influence. It'll take you back. I mean, if you think back on, on some of the, some of your past, when you hear a song, it takes you to a certain time of your life. It's it's a it's a big influence. So pick some background or, or a song, background music, and uh, and make it your your music theme. And what was interesting, when my kids were little, I took took them to karate. And so I got two little boys, and they're going to the karate class, and they got their little white suits on, and, and uh, there's probably about 40 kids in the class. My first thought was, God, I've got one karate instructor with 40 kids, and I'm I'm using four to six. Kids. Of kids on my court. I said, this guy must be killing it. Uh, but at, at some time during the, the course of the, of the karate lesson, he starts playing this real fast music. I, I'm not a music person, so I can't tell you the name of the song. But 
automatically you see all these kids jump up and they knew they were getting ready to play this game that he does when he plays his music. And it, it made you think, you know what, you, you're training these people to think like you, like you want them to think, just by having a music theme associated with it. I think it's very effective uh, marketing that doesn't really cost you anything. Demonstrations and exhibitions. Boy, we have a huge advantage because we can get on the court and, and do an exhibition uh, in front of groups. And um, we can try to tie in rackets we're trying to sell, try in, uh, tie in ball machine demos. We can get some of our, our uh, constituency on the court with us. Uh, but it's a great way to advertise your programs and then uh, and, and do some giveaways with it. So we have that built-in market, but we don't do it enough. So every place that you work should have more of those demonstrations and exhibitions. And again, what is it costing you to do? Enthusiasm, obviously. Enthusiasm goes a long way. Um, your staff has to be constantly upbeat. You know, when people come to, to your place of business, they're, they have their own lives, they have their own problems. And I, I once was on a panel discussion, uh, it was at Birmingham Country Club, and we had uh, three CMAA general managers on the panel. And one of the questions was, well, what do you think is the most important thing is your job as a, as a, as a uh, club manager? And I'll never forget the guy, uh, I think it was at the Stadia Country Club, and he mentioned, when people come to my club, you know, some of them are divorced, they got problems at home, some of them have big business problems, their businesses are tanking, uh, some of them are, are in trouble with the IRS. They want to come to a place and not have to think about anything. And all they want to do is put all that behind. And my job as a general manager is to make sure that I can make their stay here as happy as I can. That's pretty powerful. And, and I think at your places of business, it goes the same way. People come to visit you. You know, we're, we're in the fun business. We are in the entertainment business, and uh, we don't want to be downers. Post your mission statement. Makes you look focused, professional. Keeps you on track. What does it cost? Frame it. Put it out there. People read things on the wall. All right. Some ideas that cost you almost nothing. Attire. You want a professional image. Have your staff all dressed in, in the, the outfits that you want them to be noted for. Uh, if you have certain relationships with, with certain businesses, uh, promote that. You can promote that in the attire. Yes, there's some cost, but you can, if you have a, a pro shop interest, you might be able to recoup a lot of that cost with sales on that, especially if you're at a club that has logo uh, attire in the club. Develop a database. You know, there's all kinds of uh, databases out there, but this is your most important, um, I say, line of marketing uh, defense because with today's databases, and everybody has their own favorites, uh, I, I use constant uh, contact, constant contact. Um, you can you can start putting things, ask, asking for questions in that database, and get them the information you want with a couple of button pushes and that helps you market to the right group of people. If you want to market to uh, birthdays in March, you'll be able to, to, to access that at, at a fingertip. If you want to market to um, uh, men's night players or, or uh, just the junior, junior players, you can pick out all those people in your, in your database and target that. Big advantage, and you need to be able to uh, maximize the advertising based on the group that you're advertising to. Credit cards. A lot of people don't like to use credit cards because you got to pay a credit card fee. Uh, and sometimes it's as high as 3.5%. Well, that's, that's pretty costly in business. But you have to make it easy for people to buy. And if, and if, but if you make it easy, uh, just look at today's credit card debt with the average consumer in America, and uh, people use credit cards. So when you tell someone that you don't accept credit cards, 
that's hurting your business. And today, you know, you can do the square, and, and, I mean, you can do it right on your phone. I mean, it's so, so easy to do. Um, make that a part of your business. Team sponsorships. Again, we have this built-in clientele. I mean, if we do junior team tennis, if we do any kind of club teams, uh, we can get sponsors to help them, um, to help uh, delineate some of the cost for that. Uh, T-shirts or a stringing stencil or something like that is our son that uh, help with team sponsors. Find a company that wants to contribute and give them a little bit of value for that. Just think of, um, I always go back, the thing that comes to my mind whenever I think about this is that old movie, Bad News Bears, where uh, uh, Walter Matthau is the coach, and he's coaching the, little, the bunch of little uh, tigers, and uh, he has a company that comes out to sponsor their uniforms, and it's the uh, bail bonds. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but he got this, he's got this stuff for free. So, so uh, I think there's ways to maximize that. Contests and sweepstakes. You have this database, use it. If you, if you use some kind of newsletter, if you use some kind of web-based social media, there are ways for you to put contests in place to help promote your business. And, and yes, you have to give, you, there are some giveaways, but there's some cost involved. But again, if you get 10 hits for a minimum, uh, 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 for a case of balls, that, that might uh, end up selling $200 worth of merchandise. Is it worth it? Yes, it is worth it. Phone hold marketing. There's a cost involved with that, but you pay that fee and uh, you, you solicit that business, you can be put, setting up other program registrations on that phone hold marketing and that helps fill certain events. And let's face it, when you do a lot of events, you have X amount of dollars that are tied to a real expenses that are that are going to be set expenses, whether you get 10 people or 50 people, and um, you want to maximize the registrations, and phone cold marketing is a good way to do that. Signage. Place it on key visible areas, exit doors, make people read when and what you want them to read. Some of you uh, gentlemen that go into uh, the uh, the taverns and the bars, and you go to the men's restroom, and right above the uh, urinal, you'll see a lot of advertising. Uh, they have a direct marketing uh, attention span there. Um, <laughs> a little bit off off uh, the pace, but they're using the advantage they have. Uh, think about your places of business and where people have to pass by, uh, and and get some signage up. Direct mail with postcards. I know uh, direct mail is, is kind of passe now, but everybody likes to have, get something with their name on it. Uh, the problem is when you do these large mail outs in envelopes, uh, people just throw them away. They don't even open the, the, uh, the letter. But on a, on a postcard, which is a lot cheaper to send out, they will often flip it and read what's on it. So I think uh, postcards are an effective way to uh, to get some of your direct mail out, and you can, with all the, the publishing uh, options out there now that are available with software, you can make them pretty eye-catching. Inserts and articles. If your club has a mailing list and they send out um, um, newsletters or, or statements, see if you can put something in that mail out that is easily uh, removed from the, from the statement and where they can put it on their refrigerator or, or see it on a regular basis. Uh, what does it cost? You're, just, you're dealing with your own um, marketing department at your place of business and uh, it, is, it is a great way to keep that fresh in, in your mind. Gift certificates. Does anybody not use gift certificates? I mean, they, uh, golf, all golf pros, that, that's the only thing they'll use. They don't give out trophies and everything. They give out gift certificates in the shop. And uh, on the tennis side, do the same thing. I mean, you can uh, set up a lot of your uh, first, second, third prizes just based on the number of dollars you give away for your gift certificate. Or you can move merchandise that has been sitting there for a while and, uh, and say, 
pay first, first, second, third price. The gift, gift certificate is for uh, this line of women's clothing that hasn't been selling. Consultation area and hours. Pick a time and place where you'll be available to talk to your constituency. Um, and, I, and I relate this to uh, like a college professor who has in his door, uh, my, my visiting hours are from 10 to 2 or 1 to 3 on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. People want to talk to, to you and, and they, they want uh, to have that kind of touch. They want to get pick your brain. Uh, sometimes they have some personal issues they need to deal with and they don't want to do it while you're teaching them on the court, but they will come in and, and visit. And uh, it is a way to get your brand out there and, uh, in my opinion, help keep your, your job uh, just by posting some of that on your, on your door or on your advertisements. So if you're serious about marketing, uh, you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So if you're not keeping stats on all your, your dealings in, in the business, then you're, you're flying by the seat of your pants. You need to look at monthly statements, weekly statements. You need to look at what's selling on weekends, what's selling on during the week. Uh, and you need to keep track of the different trends. Uh, you need to look at weather. Weather plays a role sometimes on, on sales. Uh, the, the point being, you need to set up some way of tracking all this because if you can't learn from the data, your decision needs to be made from the data and not just from what you feel like doing or what feels good to you. So we don't want to shoot from the hip. Again, we want to keep those statistics. So let's look at um, some quick formulas for success in marketing. Uh, number one, realize that this is a commitment. Uh, marketing is not something that you, you, you do for two weeks and you, you feel like you've done your, your marketing. It has to be something that is constantly done over a period of time. Um, it is the greatest investment in your time and energy. So spend the necessary time on that. And it needs to be um, consistent and steady. So you don't want to change that often. You want to make sure when your marketing plan is put in place, you stick with it. Now, over a period of time, if you find that you, your marketing is, is not effective, okay, certainly you, can, you have the option to change your, your marketing vehicles. But the point being, don't be quick to, to uh, step off the, uh, the gas pedal. You want to make sure that it is consistent. It takes time for people to see what they like. Confidence. People are always looking for a variety of things uh, when they spend their money. And here are some of the things. They look for wide selection. They look for excellent service. They look for quality. They look for confidence. If you can't do all of those, Pick one or two that you can do, and then make sure you advertise those so that people know, again, that's what you're known for, that identity. Patience. Uh, again, the analogy I use, first you prepare the soil, then you plant the seeds, you water, you, and you have to water again, wait, you have to water again, and you have to constantly uh, uh, keep watering to make sure that your business grows. Assortment. Choose the weapons that apply to you and, uh, and use them. Again, when you look at, at, at your marketing strategies, you have to have done your homework. You have to look at your consumer. Is your consumer coming from a three mile radius or is it coming from the other side of the city? I mean, that makes a difference on how you market uh, your business, whether it's your programs, whether it's your pro shop, or whether it's membership. Uh, subsequent. So after you make a sale, if you don't follow up, you're not going to get that repeat customer. Uh, people want to be appreciated for their loyalty to you. So you want to make sure that um, you're staying in touch with them. And if you don't, then you're going to get another gorilla tennis marketer to pick up that customer and you've lost them. Diligency. These are, these are uh, stats from uh, uh, gorilla marketing. So 2% of your sales are closed with one sales call, and you can, you can read that. But look at number five, look at the fifth one. Five or more sales calls, or, or emails, or it's contact. Five or more contacts, it changes the percent of sales eight times. That, that's a pretty big number. 
So again, it goes back to you, got, you have to be patient, you have to be consistent, and you have to be diligent. All right, so that's some information I think works for, for all businesses. But let's, uh, let's hear from the group and, and see if we can exchange some other ideas on, on some good marketing ideas. Um, preferably ones that you're not going into the to bankruptcy to, to do, but something that, that is affordable. So anybody have any uh, suggestions on some of this? So Tom, the, the difference between maybe marketing your tennis business and marketing tennis is, you know, we all feel like we have a responsibility to grow the game. How, how much does that become a part of each individual's marketing of their business, marketing the game? Well, I think your exposure in the tennis industry goes directly to marketing your own business, whether it's, it's your club and the fact that you're coming to conferences, the fact that you're, on certain, you're serving on certain committees, either the USTA committees or, or association committees, your, your name exposure helps give you credibility and ultimately that helps your own business because it, it, it develops trust and it, it helps your reputation. So um, to, to your question of, uh, about uh, tennis or your business, I think anything in tennis helps your business. Yeah, I would, I would second that. I think again, especially if I'm in a small town or like I am in, when I grow my community, I'm going to grow. And, because and, and because again, you, again, it's health is going to come back. People want back. to to support you if you if you do that. They they feel obligated. You're you're giving, and they want to give back, and uh, that's the human nature of people. So they, they look for people who are, are not just uh, uh, taking advantage and, and and lining their own pockets. So it that's that's what makes our job hard because we have to be involved in so many different areas. But uh, if you do it right and the community accepts us, they, yeah, they, they'll support you, and they'll support you big time. It helps everything. Any other uh, suggestions? Yes, sir. Well, I just know, like, when we, like, we took over a club five years ago, and it, was, it had a horrible reputation, and so um, yeah, I didn't do a lot of, essentially, door to, not door to, well, yeah, pretty much door to the face to face sales as far as, um, uh, to let them know it's going to be management and stuff like that. So we did a whole bunch of guerrilla warfare uh, marketing. Um, one of the things we did was uh, we put flyers for our junior program, uh, out two-sided, and then uh, there was two of us that would go down to the soccer fields when they were having games at the public park, and we just flyered all the cars and things oh, like yeah. that. So I mean, that was like, you know, it was low cost, and, um, it just it hit your target market, and um, I mean, you know, we got a ton of response from that. Uh, but you know, things like that um, can be uh, you know, can be low cost and just a little bit of manpower, and uh, can get good results. From that. Well, I like the word manpower because uh, you know all of us don't have the, sometimes the, the the ways and means to spend money on that, but to go out with the sweat equity. That makes a huge difference, and I think that's an excellent suggestion. Anybody else? Well, I think again, like dollars and cents, and talking about like uh, marketing, and let's say again, uh, the internet, like products, like rackets and stuff like that. I think like for me, being Wilson exclusive for 20 plus years has helped me compete with the, if you go to Amazon, if you go, I will match it. Versus, let's say again in this world, in Charlotte there, a lot of clubs can, they can support a pro shop. So you have some great entities like a Queen City Tennis Shop that can partner with different other entities and say, hey, we'll support you discount wise or whatever. Just, just I don't know, just a relationship that's some really like in this world, there's a hub where can, pro shops can send people if they just don't want to have a pro shop. So it's like there's different ways of competing with that online stuff there. And so, as long as I get, I guess, like I said, even like a, I was mentioning you, like like Groupon and things like that. As long as I don't sacrifice my integrity, I would say again in the very beginning, I would market with like Groupon. But when someone comes back to me and says, "Can I give you that same amount that Groupon only charged me?" Mm, no, nah, we can't do that. So you, at some point, you got to stand your ground. But can you give me what I saw on Craigslist? Mm, 
no is not the same as what, not the same lack of, you know, things are just like, you start, you gotta get be educated enough to know what's out there to go, mm, now you're trying to pull something over on me. You know, Sally Sue, so, you know, Tom said he could, he, you only gonna charge me this much for a tennis lesson. No, we need to go at Tom and check something out. <laughs> Yes. So would you mind going like I think it was the second or third slide that Alan has a question? <laughs> Sorry. Would you give the presentation again? <laughs> I think it was yeah, that one. Okay, when, when you say when you say the discretionary spending, oh, yes. you know, is five percent in two thousand and twenty. How has it been before that? You know, the last like, <laughs> two thousand and nineteen, two thousand and eighteen. Well, th this stat is, is when I researched this, they showed me that they're predicting that that it'll be five percent more of what it was. I don't know what the number was, um, but they're predicting an uptick. And spending because of, of consumer confidence. So it's five percent more than two thousand and nine. Correct. Correct. Ah, okay. Correct. It's probably before the last ten days. Yeah. It's probably, okay. <laughs> yeah no, that's that's a, that's a good uh, disclaimer there, right there, because uh, that has changed a little bit. But overall, um, we're in pretty good shape with with, with money for the consumer. Uh, you know how we spend that money in the tennis area. You know the. Have to be creative to, to, to maximize it. Well, just to give you an idea, you know, how much was the inflation of 2019 here? Is it 2.1? 2.1, yes. Okay, in Argentina it was 54%. Wow, oh my goodness. All last year. And the tennis lessons, what I find out is they went up only 30%. Oh my goodness. So, you know, the tennis lessons yes. are great. But, you know, every year they're going down, you know. Compared to, they're not going up 54%. They're going up less. So their, you know, their like their lessons are really way low compared to their inflation. Wow. Yeah. How much is a can of flour? Yeah. How much is a can of flour? It's like 10, 12 dollars. Wow. Really? Yeah. You know, a a racket is like twice as much as the cost of beer. You know, here, you know, the comparison, the golf, the golf ball business, uh, 20 years ago, the golf balls were about the same. Now, you know, one golf ball, the, 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 the what is the most popular, the Titleist V1, is like $4 a golf ball, per ball yeah. where still a can of ball is still like around $4. I, I remember, um, <coughs> Playing high school tennis with white tennis balls and a key to open up the can, and it was dollar eighty nine for the can. Of the balls. And you can go to Walmart and and find it. I mean, Jimmy probably could speak more to this than anybody else. Well, you probably but, used that can for a week as yeah, well, yeah, not true. just one and out. Well, you know, it, 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 when I was growing up, well, and second growing up too, the balls would be using it until the felt was actually coming off the ball. And we're using them for that. And now here, you like use it once, and then they, they, they throw it into the classroom. Yeah, and, and I, I can tell you one, one of the marketing strategies I use at my club is you know, I buy new cans of balls. And I have a policy that when you buy a can of balls that you, you sell for four bucks, um, if you bring it back in two hours, um, I give you two bucks back. And then I would take those those balls that were used for two hours and put them in all the teaching baskets and I'd be able to fill up the teaching baskets at a relatively low rate and it kept people buying new balls. Uh, so there's there's ways to be creative in order to to uh, to, to maximize some sales. And, and Jimmy, I don't know if you can if you can think, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you can think of any great marketing ideas that you've seen with all the shops that, that you come across, uh, if, if you feel comfortable sharing any of them, we'd love to hear some of those. Just, uh you know, uh, we sell in certainly all the brands, but the sell through is the key because if it's just sitting there on the peg, you know, it's not moving. And then if it's an updated version of a frame or a bag or whatever, then the, the map is dropping and their margin is dropping. So I, I try to be proactive. I'm sure the other brands, we get a, a promo budget to a variety of balls, rackets, bags, 
grips and so forth, and if I see you know, certain the, the brake lights, so to speak, out, on a wall there at a certain account, I'll, I'll offer up markdown product. They can they can run an in-store special to try to encourage sales and, and keep everybody happy. So we have good flexibility to kind of work and just adapt to what what works best for that account. Yeah, I think those are important factors uh, when you're trying to sell through the merchandise in the shop because, like you said, I, I personally have had brackets hanging on the wall for forever, and, and what do you do with them <laughs> eventually? And people, you know, people sometimes are looking for a cheaper version of the newest model, but um, you got to be able to sell them on, on, on the, what's new today. Sure. That's where your maximum maximum uh, profits going to be. That's right. Any other uh, comments or, or uh, hostilities or <laughs> that you'd like to share with the group? It's kind of another thing I thought of you had on their apparel. I mean, what we did was um, for all of our league teams that won league championships, we gave them a free shirt um, and it was a dry fit shirt, but we put the logo big on the back here because most of your league championship teams play tournaments and all that stuff. And so, I mean, it's fun going to a, a regional tournament, you know, somebody like in the neighboring town or something, they're playing a tournament, and all of a sudden they see their big logo on the back there. And so, you know, even though they might not, they might be an ARC, they might be another club's player that played on our team or something, or, you know, whatever, they might not be a member of our club and they're on the league team or something like that. They're still, like, repping the brand um, for our group, and we've done that for, Four years now, and we go to the tournament, and I'll see you know a third of the players out on the court with our big logo on the back, and um, yeah, it costs a little money, like you said, they have a little money here, but I mean, it's advertising for the life of that shirt, and, yeah. uh, and it's been that shirt goes us. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's interesting that one one of the big uh, mistakes I made, I've always been fortunate to have the pro shop where I've been, and uh, I ran it ran a sale on apparel that when the ladies teams come in and play, based on the number of points they won, they got better discounts on the apparel for that day. And uh, had the uh, tennis committee bring me in one time for a meeting and say, it seems like you're rewarding the, the, the opponents who beat us, <laughs> that you're giving them better merchandise. And they were pretty upset about that. <laughs> but it was a way to move product. You know, if, if, uh, if you did well, you got some better discounts. I, I was wondering, what, what are some good if you put on there the tie-ins and co-ops with other um, with bundling products and all that um, with, or other uh, businesses and all is there any do you have any good examples of that? A lot of, of the fitness that? places a lot of the fitness places would want to tie in something that don't they're not tennis oriented uh, uh, people that uh, yes I got one for you. So, um, kind of got the idea for Larry Caragenis, and I morphed it a little bit. And Larry always comes up with a, a lot of ideas. So it's called Mall Tennis, and we used to do it at a club, and it was pretty popular. And what we did was, um, I got vendors from and merchants from around, and and once again, you're at a club that people would want to come and, and, and see your membership, and we would get any place from 15 to 25 vendors. We put them out on the court. They paid a hundred dollars each. I had five food vendors, so they put the food out for the event because they brought all their stuff for people to sample. And I'd have home theater companies, uh, landscaping companies, uh, just uh, you know, and clothing, everything. Uh, so I'm taking in this hundred dollars each. I charged our people ten dollars each to come and play in the event. And you go through each court. There was, a, there was something different on each court. You go through, you play the games, you hit on the ball machine, you do whatever. And then you could go and see the vendor. You had a chance after every, after every court to win a prize. So uh, from, from the vendors put the prizes up. So I basically got nothing in it. All the vendors are happy because they're getting a great exposure. And the members are happy because there's a lot going on out there. And uh, I had a car company out there. And they gave away a, 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 a car for two weeks. Somebody got to use a Cadillac. It was a Cadillac company. Through that agreement, they started putting their logo on my tennis ball. So now I got 50 cases a year of tennis balls paid for. Then we used it, we promised to use in all of our events. I didn't sell them, but we used them in every event. So now I had the balls paid for for every event. So it just kind of grew, but it was a really fun event um, and very festive. 
you know, I had the music playing and stuff, and here I, I didn't really come out of pocket a whole lot, and it, and it paid for itself. So that was kind of a fun way to get the companies together with you and they get to see your members, your members get to see them. So one vendor per court? Oh, I had, I know, I had, I had six courts basically going. Um, uh, so I would have uh, two to four on court. And then the food people off in, the, off in a different area would get to go and eat. And then you're charging and those members, it was just members only, and then they were, they paid ten dollars for the chance to go on the court and win the prizes and go around and see. And just play the games and do stuff. And some courts you'd win a prize no matter what. Some courts, if it was a higher end prize, you might have. Like I had two racket companies out there, so uh, if they were if they were there, you may you may have had a chance to win a racket. But you were if you, once you went through their courts, you've got to put the ticket in the raffle jar and at the end of the night you raffle it all. Pat, that's a, that's a great suggestion. Great idea. Would cool. you mind coming up and continuing the seminar? <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to get Larry in for you. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's, a, that's a good one. Any other, any other uh, suggestions? Mm -hmm. or comments? All thanks. All right, well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.